All right, so now we are reading the foreword to the language of the goddess by Maria Gimbutas. This foreword is written by Joseph Campbell. As Jean-Francois Champignon, a century and a half ago, through his decipherment of the Rosetta Stone, was able to establish a glossary of hieroglyphic signs to serve as keys to the whole great treasury of Egyptian religious thought from 3200 BC to the period of the Ptolemies, so in her assemblage, classification, and descriptive interpretation of some 2,000 symbolic artifacts from the earliest Neolithic village sites of Europe, circa 7,000 to 3,500. BC, Maria Gimbutas has been able not only to prepare a fundamental glossary of pictorial motifs as keys to the mythology of that otherwise undocumented era, but also to establish on the basis of these interpreted signs the main lines and themes of a religion in veneration both of the universe as living body of a goddess mother creator and of all the living things within it as partaking of her divinity of religion one immediately perceives, which is in contrast to that of Genesis 3.19, where Adam is told by his father creator, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. In this earlier mythology, the earth out of which all these creatures have been born is not dust, but alive, as the goddess creator herself. In the library of European scholarship, the first recognition of such a matriistic order of thought and life antecedent to and underlying the historical forms of both Europe and the Near East appeared in 1861 in Johann Jakob Bachoven's Das Mutterrecht, where it is shown that in the codes of Roman law, vestigial figures can be recognized of a matrilineal order of inheritance. Ten years earlier, in America, Lewis H. Morgan had published in the Ligue de Hodensani or, or Iroquois a two-volume report of a society with such a principle of mother right was still recognized. And in a systematic review subsequently of kinship systems throughout America and Asia, he had demonstrated an all but worldwide distribution of such a pre-patriarchal order of communal life. Bakoven's recognition around 1871 of the relevance of Morgan's work to his own marked a breakthrough from an exclusively European to a planetary understanding of this sociological phenomenon. There is to be recognized in Maria Gimbutas's reconstruction of the language of the goddess a far broader range of historical significance, therefore, than that merely of old Europe from the Atlantic to the Dnieper, 7000 to 3500 BC. Moreover, in contrast to the mythologies of the cattle-herding Indo-European tribes that wave upon wave from the fourth millennium BC overran the territories of old Europe and whose male-dominated pantheons reflected the social ideas, laws, and political aims of the ethnic units to which they appertained, the iconography of the great goddess arose in reflection and veneration of the laws of nature. Gimbutas's lexicon of the pictorial script of that primordial attempt on humanity's part to understand and live in harmony with the beauty and wonder of creation adumbrates in archetypal symbolic terms a philosophy of human life that is in every aspect contrary to the manipulated systems that in the west have prevailed in historic times one cannot but feel that in the appearance of this volume at just this turn of the century there is an evident rele relevance to the universally recognized need in our time for a general transformation of consciousness the message here is of an actual age of harmony and peace in accord with the creative energies of nature for which a spell of some four thousand prehistoric years anteceded the five thousand years of what james joyce has termed the nightmare of contending tribal and national interests from which it is now certainly time for this planet to wake forward by joseph campbell